Okay. Is uh, the hour, I mean, Pacific time, so it's 9 a.m. here. And I think it's noon for if you're in the East Coast. And um, 6 p.m. in Central Europe, South Africa, and the Middle East. And maybe if you are in the Nordic area and you're pretty close to Russia and beyond, it might be 7 p.m. And if you're in China, it's really late for you. I hope it's not that bad for you this hour. So please welcome everybody. Should we kick this off, Geraldine? Sorry. Are we ready to start? Yeah. yeah? Vero? Sí. Yeah. All right. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Amparo Leyman Pino, and I had the idea to share with you what is inclusive design of learning experiences for your science center, for your organization. I've been cooking a chapter of a book about this. And of course, I have to bring in my partners in crime, my dear colleagues, Geraldine de la Forge and Veronica Nunez. I want to describe for you how I look like if you cannot see me. Um, I'm, I'm a, a meter and 64 of uh, 164 centimeters, 5'4", for those who have the imperial system. Um, I have wavy, very rebel hair. It, it looks horrible this morning, but I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm brunette and my tone skin is between um, tan and white, but I am I'm really unsure which color skin I am. And I have an accent. I'm from Mexico and I live in the US. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and that's where I'm located. So now I'm gonna introduce you to Geraldine. Geraldine, can you tell about yourself, where you're at and your organization and affiliation location, etc.? cetera? Yes. Hi everybody. So I'm Geraldine. I'm French living in France and uh, I'm white. I've got glasses, not for a long time, but getting older and I'm blonde, quite short uh, hair. And just behind me, I I've put a photo because it's just terrible. So people can see this is the Calorque is in the south of France. And I'm working in Universios. This is a, a cultural um, institution in France, science museum. And I'm head of the accessibility department. And what I forget, tell me, Amparo. Mm -hmm. You're in Paris, right? In all that yes. beautiful country, you're in Paris. And... I'm just in Paris just at that moment and all the time. I can see just from my windows, the Sacré-Cœur. And for the moment, it's the day, but in a few moments, it will be completely dark. <laughs> and Universance is a huge science center in Paris. It is yes. two organizations, one umbrella yes. organization called Universance. Yes, in, right? fact, in fact, it's the first French public institution for the dissemination of scientific, technical, and industrial culture. And it brings together the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie, the first museum, science center, more than a museum, and the Palais de la Découverte, both in Paris. Thank you, Geraldine. And I'm also sharing the, this session and workshop with another dear colleague, Veronica Nunez. So Vero, can you please introduce yourself, describe yourself, where you're located and your affiliation or institution? Yes, of course. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening. My name is Veronica Nunez. I live in uh, Oregon, the United States, but I am originally from Venezuela. I have lived in the States for almost 20 years. And um, I work at OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. 
Currently, I am the um, Learner Empowerment Manager. Uh, I have worked for, for the museum for over 20 years. And in that path, I have done program development, exhibit development, um, event uh, uh, facilitation and uh, organization. Um, what I look like, I am, um, I guess my, my hair is kind of brown. I, some days I cannot tell because I have dyed so many times <laughs> that there are some parts that have different colors in it. Um, I guess I am fair skin, but I tan really fast. Um, so in the summer, I, you know, my, my, my skin is a little darker. I'm wearing a, a very bright uh, blue top which I love, I love bright colors. My hair is up and what else? Yes, I guess, did I miss anything, Amparo? No, 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 okay. no, no. I'm very I happy am... to be here and be with all of you today. Thank you, Vero. And um, well, today is uh, our session is about uh, inclusive design, how can we have this lens of inclusivity when we're designing exhibits, programs, festivals, whatever you're doing. And this is with the intention to bring science for all. Uh, in my practice as a um, consultant working with institutions to help them become more di diverse and inclusive, I get a lot of calls for people because I'm from Mexico, I'm from Latin America and Latinos are, um, pumping or increasing the numbers here in the U.S., I'm very often called to, to ask me, can you design things for Latinos? And I tell them, why don't we give Latinos the same thing you give to everybody else? That's my response, right? When I go to McDonald's, I want to eat the menu. I don't arrive to McDonald's and they, say me, they tell me, do you want a quesadilla? Hmm? So the same way when I come to a science center, I want to be exposed with the same opportunities as others. And that's how I have um, leveraged the learnings from a project with the um, San Diego Museum of Natural History when they created the Coast to Cactus. And I was one of the advisors for the evaluation and, and I did an assessment of their usage, usage of bilingual exhibitions. I was like, they have a brilliant uh, exhibition on mixing Spanish and English, right? That that's the way the people talk here um, at the border. So we leverage that for a project with the Monterey Aquarium and we create the blended language programming, which um, the whole purpose is to have people who speak only Spanish only English or people like Vero and I that we are bilingual in Spanish and English that we can mean the same program at the same time. So now we have an inclusive program for all. If you go to my website, yellowcow.net, you can learn about this program in more depth and all the hurdles that we went on it. But today is not about me or, or what I do for my, for my work. Um, it's more about how my colleagues, Geraldine and, and Vero, they are tackling this inclusivity lens from two different institutions in two different latitudes and how they are understanding this. And please take notes because after their presentations, what we're gonna do, we're gonna go to breakout rooms with each of us and we're gonna try to design an experience the same way using our, um, our learnings from this session for you to help us prototype or design in a mural and experience. And let's see how it goes. So I'm gonna turn it down or turn the microphone to Geraldine. And I'm doing this because she is on my left side of my screen. So <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks, Ontario. So first, Sorry for my English, I will do my best. <laughs> and I hope you will understand me. Uh, this is a kind of inclusion. You must include French people who have so many difficulties with languages, foreign languages. So I try to share, must be, yeah. 
Whoa, something's fun. Not important. Uh, so I was saying I'm working in science in a science museum. In fact, two science museums in Paris. Uh, we've got the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. This is huge. We've got maybe more than eight or ten uh, uh, permanent exhibition and four uh, temporary exhibition and exhibition for children and a special library and uh, and 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 the thing is everything must be absolutely accessible for everybody and we've got another place the Palais de la Découverte. This is not the real place, this is the temporary place because there is a lot of, uh, we have to, the, the building must be ready for the, the Olympic Games in 24. And for the moment, we've got a, a temporary place in another place, so the, the Palais de la Découverte. And this very big French institution for, as I was saying, dissemination of scientific, technical, and industrial uh, culture and its mission is of course to make science accessible to all and I and my team I'm very lucky because we are eight people are uh, special especially concerned by public far from our institution disabled people but also people far from the museum for social economical and cultural reasons and we've got two main principles, I would say. The first, above everything, is the equality and the equity. No place for any discrimination. All our buildings, of course, are accessible, but also our services, our offers must be accessible to everyone, regardless of ability. And ability, this is one of the main points. Everybody's got some, sometimes more or less, but that this is one big point. And to succeed, of course, it's necessary that the question of the equality, of the equity become a question for each employee in the two museums. So each employees, but the, the eight of us of the team more than the other. And we've got kind of mantra, is the best visiting environment for all, working upstream in project, and an inclusive accessibility policy. What I say, when I say for all, it's really for all. Of course, we are working more for disabled people and some kind of people, but it's useful for everybody. You've got here uh, a woman who is pregnant with young children, blind people, uh, deaf people, some of them can speak sign languages, other no. You've got, uh, uh, father with a pushchair, and you've got children, and we've we've got old people, friend, wheelchair, well, everybody, and this is the, the the main point. When you're working, when you try to improve accessibility for people with disability, you will improve it for everybody. Children too young to read well, okay, they will it will be okay for them families with push uh, and uh, me getting older, I always forgot my glasses and I can't see anything anymore without my glasses and it's terrible. And um, we are all concerned at what moment of our life by this specific adaptation. And well, that's not very nice what I've done, but the main important is the message that we it's impossible to improve and to include everybody if you are not if you have not thought about it from the very beginning of the project and we are very lucky in our institution because all the person in charge of the accessibility are included in the projects at the very beginning for conferences for shows for exhibition for whatever it is and this is one of the main points and we're trying to think not, okay, people, blind people or deaf people, it's not they're blind, it's not they're deaf, it's what they can't do and what they can do. Okay, they're blind, but they can hear. So let's do something 
they can hear. And that must be at the very be thought at the very beginning of the, the project. And um, we are all different in a museum, but we are all together. Uh, and if I come with my children who can't read very well or with a blind friend, we want to be in the same place, in the same exhibition, in the same show at the same moment. So we just stay together and we try to think about that from the very beginning, as I would say always, from the very ah, very beginning, because it's really, really important. And uh, each of us, we've got a lot of abilities and we must use them. We've got five senses, so we must use our five senses. And we must think about that, of course, with all the employers and with also all the visitors and ask them, okay, how can we use that? How can we use what you can do and not what you can't do? And maybe the, the, the most, most important thing is the inclusion. Of course, no exclusion. We can't even think about it. Okay, no, with a wheelchair, you can't come in, no. But no segregation, for example, it will be easier to have a, a special room with video, with sign languages. But if I come with my family, if I come with friends, if I come, I want to be with everybody. So sign languages is always in the same video that everybody can see. And we will have integration and inclusion. And what we called in our teams, integration is specific adaptation, but in the same place. For example, uh, I will put some brain for blind people, but it will be in the same place than written information. Or as I was saying, sign languages, I won't have something in another room or only in my, uh, can say it, but in my telephone, because I want to see to watch the same video with my friends, with my family. So everything will be in the same place, but there are specific, only blind people who can read braille will use it. Only deaf people who can, uh, who know how to sign will use it, but it's in the same place. But you can also have device, some same, the same device, the same design for all and will have a real inclusion. For example, when you've got subtitles, they will be used by deaf people. They also will be used by foreign people or by a family with a small baby crying, say, okay, I can read. You can see in the subway, everybody will watch at the, the video with the subtitles. And another example, uh, if you use a very simple way to write, especially in French, because you can have so complex sentences in French, it will be so useful for everybody and not only for people who have mental disease or things like that. And the same for the, mom, the models. I will show you maybe a few examples. This is the Cité des Sciences. Uh, when you arrived, uh, there is no steps, nothing. Everybody can, it's an easy way to come from the street, not from the subway, but the subway, it's not us. But from the street to the enter to the museum, no steps, easy way to come. Inside the, the museum, you can go, of course, everywhere. And well, it's fairly common, but uh, same way, same place, same exhibition for everybody. If you have a wheelchair, if you have a push chair, if you are old, if you are young. And the, the, it, it's almost the easiest part to make the building accessible to everybody. What is more difficult is to make what is in the museum accessible because you don't come in a museum to say, oh, well, that's great. 
that's nice. Okay, I want to visit exhibition, I want to watch shows, I want to have a workshop. And we use a lot, for example, of models. These two on your right, you've got two very big arms, uh, very big, must be more than one meter. And the children can touch them, can uh, see how it works. At the beginning, it was made for blind people, but of course, everybody can use them and everybody used them. And of your right, you've got the um, a 3D map of an exhibition for young people, very young people between, uh, I think it's between two and five, six years old, about the contrary. And at the, the the entrance on the, of the exhibition, we've got this 3D map uh, with all the different rooms of the exhibition. And you can have the, well, there is a, a in the first room, you've got small uh, houses. You've got them in the, on this map. And it was done for, of course, um, blind people. But if you come in the exhibition, everybody, will use it, all the children, all the family. And uh, it was, we have decided to put that, but of course, of all the team that create the exhibition with everybody and uh, at the very beginning, almost the very beginning. We've got another example, what we call whispering. Whisperings, it's, um, of course, you, we, we can put braille for blind people in the exhibition, but a lot of people with visual, visual impaired that don't read braille, because uh, if you become blind at sometimes, I don't know, 50 years old, you maybe you won't learn braille. Or if you can see a little bit and with all the new the computers, the telephones, a lot of people have stopped to learn braille. But we've got audio and the text, are, you can listen to them. So we call them the whispering. And this is another way to include everybody. Of course, blind people, children who don't know very well how to read, or just people who are lazy and say, okay, too much, too, too, too much thing to, to read in the exhibition. I just want to listen and so many things and people won't see it's a, a part of the accessibility for dis uh, disabled people and everybody will use them. And the last example, it was a few years ago, uh, we had celebrated the first International Sign Language Day. It must be the, around the 23rd of September. It was the first time in the world and in the Cité des Sciences. And this is me <laughs> and my colleague. And we will, we used both of us to be a science communicator many years ago. And we have decided this day, everybody who can't hear can have everything. And in fact, nobody will speak this day. So, well, almost nobody, if someone come to buy a ticket, okay, we can speak. But the shows, the workshop, uh, the almost the planetarium, we've got special glasses when you can have sign languages or subtitle in the sub, on, in, on, don't know, the glasses, connected glasses. And uh, you can watch all of you in the planetarium and have what they say in the subtitle and in the, um, with the sign language. And we decided to say, okay, let's do a, a show between a show and a workshop about, um, it was about, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, the memory and about uh, supraconduction, quite difficult. And we say, okay, we're gonna explain that without a word. So we were moving, 
we had pictures, we had drawing, we can do what we want, but we couldn't speak at all. And it was very funny because the audience couldn't speak at all. Say we had to ask in you've got here boxes with a hole with few holes you can put your hand in the boxes and inside there is an object there is something and you must think what is it and uh, guess what is it and uh, and people had to explain what they think it is without speaking it was quite difficult but funny and what was very funny that was that we couldn't know who was deaf and who wasn't deaf. They were maybe this day, two or 300 deaf people with speaking with sign language in the museum. And of course, other people. And it was so great to see that thinking about, okay, we, we won't do it as usual. And everybody was the same and everybody could uh, participate and we couldn't say who is deaf and who isn't. And it was a really great experience. And to, con well, to conclude, what is really important is to have a real coherence and the similar experience for all. Because if you have, for example, in an exhibition or in a conference, the beginning that is accessible and the end and in the middle, you don't know. That's not, that's not fair. And people say, okay, you, you can have that in some exhibition for blind people. Okay, you've got here the number one, the number eight and the number 15. This is accessible and okay, between no. So, the, the, the message won't be understandable. The name is. And the other thing is the experience must be similar. For example, in an exhibition, in, if in one room you have games, you must have games for everybody. You can't have games for everybody except uh, deaf people, or you can't have games for everybody except blind people and they will have just to read something. That's not funny. They come here to play with the other because in this exhibition you can play. Or if the show is funny, they must feel that. Not just a translation, not just, okay, it must be funny for them to otherwise, no. We, we will say it's not accessible for you. And the, 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 I've lost what I wanted to say to conclude, but that's it, <laughs> more or less. And so we have for that one again to thought and to design from the start for all to have the same experience in the same place at the same moment for everybody. It's not always easy. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes it's not possible, but it's what we try to do. Thank you. One, sorry for my English, must be a lover, but that was why I wanted to say to you today. Thank you, Geraldine. Every time I listen to you and to all the projects and the things that you do, I am beyond inspired. I just want to listen and to be writing and writing and writing ideas that you prompt. And yes, I agree with our, our um, colleagues. Please do not apologize by <laughs> any means because it's very um, admirable that whoever is bilingual, is, is, it's a lot of work. So I'm gonna do just a housekeeping while we transition to listen to another inspiring colleague and practices in another science museum. Uh, if you are still on the platform of the conference, jump to the Zoom, okay? 
I'm putting the, the link in the in the chat, jump in the Zoom, because we're going to do break and rooms after Vero is done. So we can put in practice all these things that we've been inspired by Geraldine and by Vero. We're going to make, um, uh, we're going to be in, in break and rooms and we're going to try to design with you something. Um, so please, please, please come to the Zoom so we can see how many people and everything uh, we are going to divide the group. Uh, yes, thank you. Don't, don't stop the recording because now it's Veronica Nunez turn to, um, to be her turn to share with us and inspire us with what OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, does. So Vero, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I love learning from other museums, other colleagues. And I just want to say that whenever uh, <laughs> listening to another person who is speaking English with an accent, it's just very inspiring. And I think um, for many people that come and walk through our museums, when they find that, they feel comfortable. So I think instead of like sometimes, because I feel like I have done that too, where I am like trying not to hide it, but to just like, you know, like improve it, like try to really pronounce super well. Then I have come to realize that other people who cross my path, especially in the museum, sometimes that's a sign of welcome and saying there's other people who work in this museum who also are bilingual or who also are learning English. And I think that is, that is beautiful and is powerful. And I want to, um, I will share a little more of that and how bringing our whole self into the experiences that we are designing, into the experiences that we are sharing it's so important because as people see us, they might feel comfortable to share their whole self with us as well. So with that, I am going to share my screen so I can share my presentation. Let's see, share screen. Oh, wait. Um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So today I am going to share with you a project that is in current development at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in partnership with this wonderful organization, Adelante Mujeres Biomimicry Institute and Fleet Science Center. It has been funded by the National Science Foundation. We just recently found a title for this exhibit um, uh, in the proposal, it was called this Designing Out Tomorrow. Now we have found a title, which is Wild Creativity or Creatividad Silvestre, which Amparo helped us in the process. <laughs> so Amparo, we are, have a title now. Um, and uh, I would love to share a little bit more about this project uh, focused on biomimicry and how to engage families in the practice of being inspired by nature to um, engage in engineering. But before that, I wanna share a little bit about me and um, this journey that I have had in this world of science. Um, my background is in education. And um, I wanna say this because about this whole thing that I was sharing about sharing our whole self. Some of the people that are in the field of science and science education, uh, sometimes we don't come from a science background. And I think at the beginning and some days still, I feel like, ah, am I enough, you know, of a science person to be doing this? Um, are there people that have a lot of expertise in certain subjects to be able to speak from a more scientific place about this. But <clears throat> what I have found out is that my own identity has helped me, helped me to connect with the audiences. 
to connect with people that like me, when they were growing up, didn't feel like they belong to this field. So to me, the passion for inclusion and the passion for people feeling like they belong comes from my own feeling that I didn't belong um, in, in science when I was growing up. It was until I arrived to the States 20 years ago that I had freshly graduated in Venezuela uh, from education that I found this opportunity at the Oregon Museum of Science of Industry. Here you can see me, this was almost 20 years ago, maybe like 19 years ago, working with some Latina girls. There was a program called Latinas en Ciencia, which was about teaching girls in Spanish third from third to fifth grade about science. So I was like, I applied to this job because I, I was passionate and I am passionate about education and two, because it, it was in Spanish and I wanted to make sure that I was able to be learning English, but work in my own language. So I started teaching the girls and designing my own classes and just seeing, I saw so much, so much of me in them, like, and so much of my inspiration was like, I want to provide to this group the inspiration that I didn't have when I was growing up. So that's, that was my first, like, you know, like spark about like, okay, uh, how to make these experiences more inclusive, how to make science more approachable, how to make feel, uh, people feel welcome when they walk into our spaces. So this is me teaching uh, through my teaching, you know, journey. This was 20 years ago in my one of my first events about Cinco de Mayo with my, uh, the person who hired me and I adore. And you, I'm a mom, so I put some picture of my son right here and in this picture and my nephew because they are such inspirations for me too. I want them to continue this journey and um, feel welcome in the sciences and, and hopefully they are connected to also making other people feel included. These are some of my coworkers and I just wanted to put there like, ah, this is about having fun. You know, like we are supposed to have fun as we have this journey. And right here, it's just um, uh, me in a costume doing theater because this has also inspired so much of what I do. Uh, because it, it, I feel like, again, as we work, sometimes we are like, oh, I'm bringing my science hat to this. And I'm like, I, in my journey, it, it hasn't been easy. Like it has taken me some time, but I'm like, no, theater and science can work together. You know, like arts is such an important part. What of the practices that I do in other places, like the theater can apply to the science world, to the exhibit development. What of the crafting that I do actually can enhance the experience of other people that walk in the museum. So this is an invitation for myself to keep doing it. And for you, if you have passions in other areas, if you feel like your heart is moved in other um, fields, bring that passion. This passion help us connect to other human beings. And to help us, you know, really bring the heart into the work we do. With that said, um, and please feel free to put any questions, you know, in the chat as I talk or just, you know, talk. It's, it, that's, that's fine with me too. So in this biomimicry project that I'm doing that I'll go a little bit more deep into it. Um, basically, this is the concept or the um, definition that we are trying to use uh, as we develop this exhibit. Biomimicry engages us with nature strategies to design solutions for the challenges we face in our own communities and around the world. So I think we try to uh, approach this definition from a really like inclusive perspective, which is, you know, going and saying, 
not only, you know, for this person or that person, it's like, no, communities around the world, how can we use this biomimicry, this inspiration in nature, so people can connect with solutions wherever they are in the world. And I think many subjects, if not all subjects, usually have a universal connection to different individuals. And that's so important because as we find what is that is common about us, you know, like Geraldine is in Paris, you know, Amparo is in San Francisco, and I'm here. And when we talk, there's so many things in common that we have. As Geraldine was presenting, I'm like, yes, that's that I, I can relate to that. I could find ways in which her experience is different than mine, but finding the things that actually are similar can create this sense of inclusion and creating spaces where we can find places that actually connect us to different people. So this project is about a engaging families in engineering design challenges through a sustainable biomimicry uh, lens. Hopefully families will engage and advance their own uh, engineering prof uh, proficiencies and abilities and um, create you know, better life for them. Our audiences, we are focused with uh, families and children, particularly girls nine to 14. And our professional audience is exhibit developers, designers, facilitators. Um, in all the deliverables, we have a, a bilingual research, we have an exhibit design challenge framework, a bilingual exhibit that is 2000 square feet that will be traveling around the States and maybe uh, and other countries and then other programs complementary for educators and other professionals. What I want to share, and this is a little bit about right now, we are not yet uh, in, the, um, in the production phase. We are still designing the experience. And I want to share with you some of the strategies that we have thought about from the beginning of the project to try to make this exhibit more inclusive for everyone. Traditionally, what OMSI has done in the past, um, and I've been around OMSI for 20 years, so I have seen the development of many projects, but in the beginning, I feel like we saw more like the inclusion, like let's make an exhibit for Latino families. Let's make an exhibit for indigenous communities. Um, and I think as we have evolved the conversation, and I think Amparo and other professionals that had been our advisors throughout the year had helped us get here, it's like, okay, how can we make experiences that really speak to more audiences? What are the things that we can do to actually make these spaces welcoming for as many people as possible? as we celebrate a specific cultures, because we can do that. We, we, we cannot at the same time be general, you know, like, you know, just be so generic that you don't know, you know, what things are about or who is this uh, designed for. So for example, we can be inclusive for all, but still design things that people, when they walk in, they are like, Oh, I love there. There's a picture that represents me. There is this experience that relates to my culture. This, there is an event that speaks to my interest. So I think we found we are in the journey of finding these strategies that can speak to that. So this is the floor plan so far that engages people. You can see different like hands-on, you know, um, experiences and um, designs that we are doing. We are currently prototyping and learning about how to improve these experiences. But one of the things that, you know, a strategy that I feel, you know, OMSI has always, you know, been good about, but we're improving is all of these hands-on and, uh, you know, like how experiences 
comes on me like trying to offer things that engage the senses, you know, um, as Geraldine was highlighting, you know, so for example, our, uh, auditive um, support is not only for people who cannot hear. Many people benefit from this. Bilingual exhibits, when you put a different language into an exhibit, not only people who are bilingual benefit, there are so many benefits about having multiple language and exposure to different languages. Uh, having things that are tactile, having things that are visual, having things that are immersive, um, having things that people can do, a smell, and physically uh, experience through different um, senses. So let's see. I let me see. Okay, perfect. So these are some of the general strategies we are using for this exhibit, Wild Creativity, Creatividad Salvaje. Okay, so from the beginning, we said we are not targeting one single culture for this uh, uh, exhibit. We will do it bilingual, English and Spanish, because it's a practice that we have started do in the museum. There is a big group of, um, there is a huge community in Oregon that uh, are from a uh, Latino heritage or that prefer to speak Spanish. So we are trying to implement this across the museum. We also, for this project, had a youth advisory board from a Latina organization that helped us think about other girls and what would be interesting to them. And I will explain this strategy a little more because I think this is very different from other things that we have done in the past. We represent stories from around the world. And we also, although it was not written in the grant, are working with the Oregon Commission for the Blind to make the experience more accessible. So I'm going to uh, also, this is another, I just wanted to show you my team because I love them. And this is part of a strategy that I feel also has been super helpful is the capacity building part, uh, which is, you know, um, trying to build teams that can represent different visions. When you start building teams within your organization that can bring different perspectives about different backgrounds and different experiences, your experiences will automatically start to grow and be nourished by those visions. So um, in this case, we have, we have people from different countries, people who are bilingual, people from different um, learning paths um, with different um, challenges. So this has really, really helped. And many of these women that you see here are or were in the, uh, in the exhibit development process of this exhibit. And, here is us just like after we knocked out a piñata. So because we try to do different, you know, like uh, celebrations and stuff as we, uh, as we are doing, you know, like we celebrate and different people from our teams bring different ways of celebrating milestones or different things. And that day that, that, that happened to be what we were doing. Um, and so, I just wanted to bring this because this is a key. Often people ask like, how can we, you know, feel people, you know, make people feel welcome when they walk into an exhibit? It's like, well, you have to start hiring people from different walks of life. So when they walk in the museum, they see people from different parts of the world with different accents, with different abilities, with different uh, learning styles. So that's the way you start actually uh, making people feel more welcome. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the youth advisory board that we use or we work with specifically for this exhibit. So traditionally in the past, if we were going to learn to um, build an exhibit for Latino audiences, we will create an advisory board with Latino uh, professionals, girls, youth. In this case, we still work with an organization 
uh, Adelante Mujeres, that their mission is to engage uh, Latino women and girls and empower them. But the ask this time was different. When we were meeting with the girls and the professionals there, we were like, we want you through your identity to think about other girls around the world. We want you to think about, you know, what is interesting about this topic of biomimicry? What is exciting? And what do you think other girls around the world will find exciting about this work? So we didn't ask, you know, what do you think other Latinas or other girls with your same identity will feel excited about? No, we were like, use your own identity, use your own self, but think about other people. Think what you have in common with other girls. And then from there, we want to hear your recommendations. So the idea of the Youth Advisory Board was to come up with recommendations, a list of recommendations that they had that could help us with the exhibit development that will let us know from their perspective was exciting about biomimicry and that we should take into account when we were developing the exhibit. What would they recommend these girls nine to 14? So we started a cohort in January and in February of 2020. We started meeting with the girls and we did activities about biomimicry and nature and engineering. And we asked them, you know, what do you find exciting about this? What would you like to see, you know, when you walk into an exhibit? What do you think other girls would love to see when they walk into an exhibit? They interview other biomimics and professionals in the biomimicry world. And they um, interview them and ask them about their professions and what they did and their lives. It was very interesting because many times girls were like, when they were interviewing biomimics, they were like, so what do you like to do on the weekends? And are you married? Do you have kids? So these girls, you know, make us think about different things that people are interested in. You know, like people are interested in people and what other people do and how they connect to them. And what we are realized is like the girls wanted to see themselves too and be like, oh, what this person like, what do I have in common with this person? So we did many activities, including that. Then COVID happened, you know, as you, as you know. So we continue our work. You know, we couldn't meet with the girls anymore, but we started meeting with the educators and the facilitators that work with the girls to continue expanding these recommendations. So for example, what we came up with, what, were, what was interesting to girls nine to 14, they love water. They talk a lot about water. They talk a lot about going to the ocean or going to the river or playing with water. This was huge. They were very interested about connection, human connection and connection with nature. Like they really, are interested in knowing, you know, not just like, oh, this is, you know, this invention or this experiment or this science fact. No, they want to know how is that connected to their lives? How is that connected to the things that they, that, that they do? How is that connected or relevant to their daily, you know, doings? And then finally, collaboration. I have two minutes. Ay, Dios mío. Okay, I am going to try to, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I only have like two slides left. Okay, okay, here. And then finally, this is the final instrument that we design based on the recommendations of the girls. So as you can see, there's many things here. Like for example, visuals, they want to see in the exhibit other girls. Like they want pictures of other girls. They want to see animals and trees and plants and pictures. And they want vibrant colors and natural colors. The voice, they want nature is portrayed as a place of peace. And they want to see the diversity and perspectives in telling stories. And as you can see, there is another way, um, another, I, I, I mean, another chunk that is about activities. They want to know why they are doing this. They just don't want to do an activity and be like, oh, I'm doing this. No. I'm doing this because it benefits my community. I want to do this because I'm learning how to be more, you know, like 
I don't know, like efficient in this activity. And then feelings, like they want to feel hopeful about the world and inspired and accomplished and connected. So as you can see, these recommendations are amazing. And we are using these recommendations as we go through our exhibit development. And I just want to show you how some of these recommendations are being reflected in our prototyping. As you can see, we are putting actual pictures of you know, nature, but some drawings as well. And we are putting pictures of actual people um, and, and the processes and the relevance and the colors that they ask. This is not final, we're still prototyping, we need to refine, but this is basically how that process went. And thank you, muchas gracias. This is our team <laughs> because it's, it takes a village to make an exhibit. It takes many people, but I just wanted to show you and to give credit to them. They are amazing. And that's my email if you ever want to contact me to ask more questions. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Verito. I, I want to say we have some questions in the chat. And uh, I know that there's um, curiosity, right? On, well, if you want to include everybody, sometimes you cannot aim that goal. What are you gonna do, right? And I would like to put that question to Geraldine because she's my teacher. She, she taught me what to do in those cases. So Geraldine, at La Cité, at Universans, what do you do when there's, for example, that exhibit that you were sharing with me about the, being a spy, that you were like, well, there are some people that cannot play this one. What, what do you do with in, that, in those cases? Yeah, we say, okay, it won't be accessible to you. It was, it was we, 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 we've got this exhibition about spies and you have to, to be yourself a spy and you've got two parts, in fact, of the, in the exhibition. You've got, of course, a lot of information, and that was not so difficult to make that part accessible to everybody. But then you've got there is a um, uh, a series in France. It's called uh, I don't know anymore. Uh, ah, well, doesn't matter. It's uh, you can watch it on the TV with a lot of spies, and we have. A collaboration with them and so you've got uh, short movies and explain okay these guys maybe is a spy you must look over there over there over there and everything was very visual and it was impossible to make this part accessible to blind people we've got uh, 18 months and it was impossible and we say okay for the first time we say this exhibition won't be accessible for people who are visual impaired because it's not fair. We say, oh, this is a great exhibition. You can be a spy. You can, uh, I don't know the name in English, uh, be like a policeman or spy. Okay, you have to look for something and to, but it's not possible for impaired, uh, visual impaired person. So we, didn't want them to come in the exhibition. And I think I've read, I've read something in the chat about autistic people. And uh, I think one of the most important thing, of course, we have to be accessible, but we have to communicate about that and to say how we are accessible, what people can find, because you can have two, for example, I've got um, one of my colleagues She's got visual impaired, but she can read a little bit. If it's dark, she can't see anything, but if it's not so dark, she can do things. And only her know what will be okay for her. I, I can't decide for her. So we try to explain, okay, the, we, we, we have done our best for the exhibition, for the shows, for this is what you will find. And people will, will choose. Uh, depending of what they like and what they can or can't do. I've got another example. Uh, we are trying for, with the COVID. Uh, uh, everything was closed in France or the museum. So we decided to say, okay, let's put some things on the internet and on our website. But it was difficult to say what 
can people understand, won't understand, and we started to create an uh, accessimetre. It, it, it's um, like an emoticon, like a smiley, okay? Blue one, red one, uh, green one with a smile, with not a smile. I say, okay, this is accessible, but the, the 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 concept can be difficult, but it's in, in a easy way to explain it. Or this is uh, we we explain how and why it is accessible, and each person will choose depending of its own abilities. But it's really important to communicate and to explain and to tell and not to lie. It's not accessible. Okay. Tell it. Yeah, be upfront, right? Is that when yeah. you go to the amusement park and they say, if you're not this high, you cannot ride. And you don't get excluded. Oh, I'm excluding me. No, it's for your safety, right? And this is has a purpose. And it's not that we're trying to be mean. We're doing an effort that everything is inclusive but this. And it's okay. Uh, and then for the uh, our communities that need a peaceful space there are a lot of institutions that open early or in in specific hours to turn down the exhibitions or the spaces that are sensitive for these communities and these families so they have this time and place for them to enjoy the museum the science center the place the that at their own pace and their own environment so they have those, those um, that balance, right, on, on those things. Berito, do you want to say anything about how to be clear on the inclusivity, or should we move forward with the, with the design? What do you want, well, or do you want well, to reply to any of the comments in the chat? Yes, of, of course. I think there was one um, that was about... Um, Yes, while creativity will be uh, um, available for uh, renting, so you can email me and I will connect you with the salesperson at OMSI. Um, we expect that the, um, the, the exhibit was, will start, start traveling sometime next year, 2022, by the end. Uh, and then regarding, oh, how do oh. I find the oh, partnership? Yes. Partnerships, Vero, exactly. Go for it. What, uh, it was about the finding the girls. Is that what the question or yeah. which one? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, usually it, it, it's hard during COVID, but the thing is like uh, we, um, most of the time we find the, the groups of girls or youth or uh, families through partnerships. So it's really hard. I have found in the past to just, you know, as a museum, start reaching, you know, to different families and try to uh, form those focus groups or those advisory groups. It's better, in my experience, a better practice to identify a community or a community organization that already has access to the families, that already work with families, and you partner with them in a project or you partner with them, and then they will be able to bring the families. So we have different organizations that we have partnered through the years that have, you know, families that work, uh, that have, you know, children in preschool, families that have children in middle school or children in high school. So we work directly with the organizations to organize that because otherwise I have found that it's really hard just for us to try to recruit them from, you know, from anywhere. Thank you, Vero. So let's move uh, on to the design part. We want you to play with us to the design part. And I don't know if it's our people, our friends from uh, V Fairs or Daniel, who's going to help us create the breakout rooms, or I can do it myself. I am fine with it. So we're going to go to small groups and we're going to, I'm going to share my screen to show you what you're going to uh encounter with this mural so you're gonna be in a mural and if you're in a room with Geraldine 
you're gonna design a an, an activity that is called meeting sky and space with her and you're gonna try to bring ideas brainstorm what things we can do to make that experience super inclusive with Vero, you're gonna work on a ex, uh, temporary exhibition on food and nutrition. And with me, we're gonna create a multi-generational program for emerging technologies, okay? We're, and that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna play with that uh, for um, something like 20 minutes. Uh, and then, um, and here, um, Oh, thank you for mentioning our dear colleague, Beth Raymond Jones. I have worked with her at the NAC when she was the director of exhibits. And now she's at the Monterrey Aquarium. She's a huge supporter of inclusive practices, bilingualism, and of course, um, blended uh, language um, exhibits and programming. So here is the, the link to the, to the mural. And now we're gonna... Um, make uh, the breakout rooms. I'm gonna assign them automatically. 